So if you will join me in welcoming Rahana Nathu, founder and CEO of Spectrum Impact, Ander Iroyeta Goyena, Vice President, The Impact Engine, Jessica Matthews, Global Head of Sustainable Investing at JP Morgan Private Bank, and Yusuf George, Managing Director, Engine Number One, for this session entitled, Greenwashers Beware, Using ESG for Good and Not for Evil. With that, I'll turn it over to Rahana. Thank you, Monique. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations uh, for making it to the last day of SOCAP. Everyone here gets a gold star <laughs> for staying for the last day of SOCAP. Good on all of you. Um, we're pretty excited to be today because uh, we have an opportunity to sort of take everything that we've heard this week and bring it to you live um, when we're talking about ESG, which has been highly topical this week. So thank you for hanging with us. I am beyond thrilled to be on stage with these three folks. Um, you know that, you have access to their bios. But I think what I'm particularly excited about is that everybody on the stage has had um, a time in this space as both student and practitioner, which is a really, really unique uh, and very humbling combination of expertise. So I'm hoping that everyone here today um, and even all of you through the Q&A function will have a chance to really share what we've learned uh, and then also what hasn't been going great, what we see improving, where we see this field going. Um, unlike the wonderful debate that happened on Monday, we're gonna move away from a conversation around whether ESG is worth keeping. Um, we all chose this industry, so uh, spoiler alert, we probably think yes. Um, and we're gonna talk instead about what happens when it is um, used well, and then what happens and the dangers of it being used poorly. Um, so uh, you all know how to do this, you've been doing this for five days now, but Please, please, please submit questions in the chat. We will have ample time for Q&A. We can't wait to hear from you. Um, and we're gonna kick right off. So I'm gonna start um, a little bit with, uh, with a question for everybody. Uh, question uh, to give you all a bit of a sense of how everybody on stage uses and defines ESG, and then specifically how their organization practices it. So Andre, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, for sure, happy to. Um, so yeah, so I work for Impact Engine, uh, and we essentially do two things. We invest in impactful companies and funds, and I sit on the fund side of the investing that we do. And for us, really, ESG, I, I guess the place to begin for us is really to just recognize the difference between ESG and impact, right? For us, ESG is about risk management, and for us, impact is about creating outcomes. So for us, whenever we're sort of looking at ESG, it's really sort of almost table stakes yeah. for really good financial investing, uh, right? Because it's a material risk to any business. And we sort of look for that to be deeply underwritten. Now that takes a variety of different forms, whether it be ESG policies, memos, things like that. Um, but yeah, that's a little as to how we sort of view Fantastic. it. Fantastic, amazing, thank you. On to me, um, all right, great. Thank you, thank you for having me, Rahana. I just, um, an embarrassing little tidbit is that I found out about 15 minutes ago that we were on the main stage and not in a breakout. Um, and uh, that's just poor planning and understanding on my part. So thank you for including me in this main stage thing. I'm sure there are plenty of my impact investing friends in the room. I, I like to see you, but these lights are so bright. Uh, we have no idea. You're out there, but we can't really see. Anyway, uh, good to be here. Um, so yeah, that was perfect because I'm just going to completely agree and just kind of layer on a little bit more specifics to add to how we do it, but, um, but that was exactly kind of in our same thing. We have, you know, I, my title is the, the head of sustainable investing. So that's the term that we like to use at the private bank. We think it just um, encapsulates a lot of different approaches. And honestly, it's just best defined by those approaches. So then we get very specific. And I spent a lot of my time trying to educate advisors at JP Morgan about these differences because there's so much confusion. There's so much conflation of terms. So we're very specific. First, you start with values-based investing, which is kind of a little bit of a rebrand we did around what's been known as you know, exclusionary screening. Um, our friends at Open Invest, who we actually acquired uh, a year ago, as you may have seen, uses that term. And it's really great because really clients are trying to reflect their values in their portfolios, and you can do it by excluding. But with them, we're actually going to find ways to like lean into things that clients care about. But there, it is really still always about a client value. And I think we'll come back to the discussing more of those specifics, too. Then it's on to ESG, so well defined, so I don't need to add to that. Um, but that is kind of one of our key approaches. Um, and you know, different ways of looking at ESG, though, I will say that we view ESG integration, you know, the holistic looking across an entire portfolio. 
um, is a bit different than an ESG strategy or a strategy that has a distinct sustainability objective within an ESG fund. So a little bit of a nuance there, but, but totally agree with generally the definition that you gave on that. Then we go into thematic investing. I think that's kind of pretty well understood, but a lot of clients have interest in specific areas. So we, we develop and curate options around those different themes. And then, and then on to impact investing, of course, which you described so well too. So that's our four part framework and that's how we think of it. Amazing, thank you. Hey. Hey. <laughs> uh, really excited to be here. So thank you okay. everyone um, for inviting me. Uh, Yusuf George, I'm Managing Director of Active Ownership at Engine Number One. Um, and defining ESG is a, is a tricky thing. Um, I spent about 10 years in this industry and uh, came at it from the ESG data and rankings side of it first. And, and way before that, I, before I got gray and, um, and uh, lost all my hair, I was on the finance side of things. Um, at engine number one, we think about ESG as criteria. Um, it is data. It's data sets that we use to embed in our models. Uh, we think a lot about sustainability of a company, right, to your point. Um, and the way that we define it is we think about is a company meeting or exceeding the cost of capital um, while internalizing all externalities, basically the positive and the negative impacts that they have. What we think a lot about is like when we value a company, are they creating positive benefits for their stakeholder groups or they're not. Um, and if they are, it should extend sort of the terminal value of the company, meaning they will exist for a longer period of time because they are more sustainable. So we think a lot about sustainable businesses rather than ESG, and ESG is criteria and data used to manage risks um, as we embed them into our models. I love that, and I, I think the exercise that even we just did is critically important because the shared understanding of exactly what we're talking about needs to be a part of every conversation. Um, the work that we do in Spectrum is basically to build impact investing strategies for, for clients. Um, almost all um, asset owners are asset managers, and I can't count on my fingers and toes how many times we have someone walk in with a definition that doesn't serve them, actually. It might be the right definition, but it's not right size to what they want to do. Um, and so it's encouraging that, that in the work that every single one of you does, starting with a framework, starting with an assertion about exactly what we're talking about here is part of the job. Um, it might seem boring, it might seem like the unexciting part of what we do, especially when you've spent 15 years in this space, but it's a reminder, even sitting here, that it's critically important, so thank you all, thank you all for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to move for a second to the idea of active engagement. This, to me, is, a, is an area that is unbelievably fascinating, um, uh, and, and uh, Yusuf and Andre, you both do this in very different ways, and I was hoping you could share with us, what does active engagement mean to you, and where and when is it critical in the work that you do? And Yusuf, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, for sure. So m maybe it's helpful for me to perhaps start with who engine number one is. Yep. Um, we're, we're fairly new to the, to the investing world. We've, we've only been around for two, two and a half years. Um, and the way we think about things as an investment company is we think that there's an incredible opportunity right now um, because there is sort of a once in a generation moment happening where there's a transition of a couple different systems. Think about the energy transition, thinking about the, um, the, the auto space, uh, think about supply chains and supply chain disruptions, think about food and ag, water shortages, droughts, et cetera. So there's these transitions that are happening. Um, and what we try to do is identify where there are companies who are leading an effort or who have identified strategies to lead through that transition. Um, very famously, we, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about um, some work that we've done with Exxon, but there's work that we've done with companies like John Deere or General Motors, um, because we've identified and we underwrote companies for the long term who we believe are gonna lead through that transition. Now, I bring that up because the way in which we work is we collaborate with companies. We use what we call active ownership, um, how we engage on accountability and transparency, how we collaborate with other investors, um, how we do our sort of deep-rooted engagement work um, in a very focused approach. And as an active owner, we believe that our job is to help to accelerate uh, companies' investment and value into their stakeholder groups through this transition, ultimately because if they're is greater investment in stakeholders, the company will be more resilient. At least that's our belief, and that's what our models show us. So um, when we think about active ownership, it really comes down to those three things, which is accountability and transparency. It is about working deeply with companies, um, and it's about collaborating with investors as needed to really ensure that there is long-term alpha generation for shareholders, for our end investors, but also greater investment in stakeholders. Yeah, I love that framework, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then for us, you know, Yusuf has the privilege of sort of 
doing ESG in the public markets, impact engines operating the private markets. And right as I mentioned, we sort of investing both in companies and funds. When we're looking at com the company side, right, so everything from investing in a Series A all the way to a Series C, D, et cetera, what we're trying to do is to use almost ESG as a due diligence tool on the way in. Mm -hmm. And usually our process entails by getting to understand the business, understanding what are its public comparables, and then using the SASB industry standards to sort of understand, hey, what are the particular material factors that are relevant for this sector in which the company operates? And with that sort of standards, which is really sort of built on a pragmatic sense, it's not an exhaustive list of 200 items, it's usually folks at around 10, we sort of use that to have conversations with the company on the way in to sort of understand where they are in their ESG journey. Then when we sort of turn into portfolio management on the companies, right, we, the board seats that we hold, we usually hold them to sort of be the voice of impact in those companies, to really sort of make sure that the impact at the board level is sort of being protected and thought about and really ingrained into the value proposition of this business that no matter who's running it, no matter who this company exits it to, it's so ingrained in the value proposition that it's gonna be there for. And our job is really to sort of take the maturity of, right, investing at a company at a seed stage, all the way to when it's sort of ramping up to a potential IPO or wherever, you're sort of introducing more and more complexity in the ESG reporting and in the M impact KPIs that we're tracking. And so we're sort of working with them to maybe the first couple of conversations, it's like, hey, FYI, these are the things that we wanna see from you, and it's okay if the answer for this quarter is an A, but let's sort of develop a strategy so you have visibility. And we try to do it in a very pragmatic sense and in a way that is not just a burden to sort of report to us, but really setting it up for success for when they're public. And then for when we're investing in funds, it's sort of similar. We sort of try to work with them to see, hey, this is how we do it when we invest in companies. Obviously, if it's a venture fund, that applies. If it's a middle market buyout fund, there's all this world of ESG consultants and environmental consultants and sort of third party reports. But the idea still sort of holds that Whenever we are investing in funds, we like to be on the LPAC and we like to be the voice of impact on the LPAC and make sure that throughout all these uh, due diligence processes that these firms are doing, that there is a clear, systematic, pragmatic way of conducting ESG diligence. Yeah, and hopefully a resource when things get exactly. hard, right? Exactly. Yeah. Jessica, I want to stay on that because I think uh, the, the responsibility that JP Morgan has across the due diligence function is huge. Um, and, and being able to do due diligence effectively as Andre and Yusuf both intimated is, is hard, it's challenging work. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that looks like within your role? Yeah, absolutely, it is hard work. And it's, you know what's interesting too, it's, it's hard on like the fund managers in some way because they have to do two things really well, right? We are always trying to like justify our existence and that they're gonna perform just from a financial standpoint, if that's the goal, which generally what we're looking at is funds that have some kind of market rate performance goal. And then we also expect them to have a sustainability objective that they can demonstrate to us. And that portion is really important to the discussion here today because we have to be looking for funds that are legitimately doing that and you know, so-called like avoiding greenwashing. Um, yesterday I was actually on one of our own um, client event panels and that panel, sort of like a different take on this panel, it was called you know, sustainable investing, um, promises, pitfalls, and execution. And again there, it's like, you know, talking about how there's so much confusion and, and almost like there's ways in which we've, we've weirdly like over-promised on what ESG could deliver or people have mistakenly thought that ESG was something that it isn't. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we, again, back to our framework, we really try to be very specific. So on the due diligence question specifically, um, you know, I give that as a backdrop because on the performance side, we do, we think it's really important to convey to our clients because they're looking to us to be very thorough on our due diligence. And we do the same due diligence for any fund, so-called SI, you know, sustainable investing labeled fund as we do for anything else. We run them through a 4P process as we call them, really digging in on who the people are. So in the case of a sustainable fund, do they have the right people to execute on understanding whatever sustainability component is in the portfolio. Increasing that's really important in these thematic strategies. Like as we're talking about like energy transition issues, that's not just like ESG analysis. That's really like, do people understand the implications mm -hmm. of an energy transition? So really important on the people, um, the philosophy. So the philosophy comes into why they're doing it, how they're doing it, how they're embedding it, you know, just digging in on that. Um, then as you can imagine, kind of a, one of the more important things is the process around it. You know, what are they actually doing to embed sustainability? How are they looking at ESG? 
And that's where it's like you really have to spend time you know, on the active side with these portfolio managers because you have to like get deeper and ask them the questions so that you start to listen to how they're using ESG as an input. If it legitimately feels like it's driving you know, a stock buy or sell decision. Um, and, um, and so that's really important. And then, of course, the fourth P is, is on performance. Do we think that they can deliver for their stated goals, both sustainable and performance? Um, and then I just add one thing, too, that really leverages what my friends here just said, which is, you know, especially in, um, you know, equities, public or private, we really like to see managers that are engaging because that's where you can dig in deeper and have impact. So we think some of the best managers are also going to tell us a story, not just a story, but demonstrate mm -hmm. <laughs> how they're doing, um, you know, engage, how they're engaging with companies. You know, there could be entry points where they don't feel like the company's perfect, but they got in there to make the change. So, um, so that's a really important component for us too. So we really are trying to avoid greenwashing. It's why I made the distinction earlier between an ESG fund and ESG integration, because we ourselves are trying to be better on ESG integration, but we don't say that that's a sustainable investing fund. And I think it's a really important distinction. Yeah, I want to double click on this because this framework has actually helped us immensely in the work that we do. So this differentiation between ESG and process and ESG as outcome is quite valuable because I think a lot of folks that are new to the space tremble a little bit and rightly so to be labeled as an ESG manager. There, there is, we're seeing it now politically, we're seeing it now in public discourse. There's a lot of, there's a lot of heft that comes with that. And so for folks in the room that are, are feeling that way, maybe your stakeholders are not as keen as you are, um, I would just encourage you to think, all three of the folks on the stage have talked about it, but looking at ESG as an, part of your investment discipline is accessible to everybody, whether you call yourself a sustainability manager or not. There is a process framework here, and then there is an outcome framework here, and we all could be ESG-wise, ESG-smart investors without ever really having to go and, and, and sit on panels and talk about ourselves as ESG funds or sustainability funds. And so I really I loved what you said there, and I think it just needed to be underlined that... Um, it's not, it's not that hard of a goal if we sort of chunk it out into, into little pieces. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, Yusuf, I want to come back to you because I actually think engine number one has had quite a few victories in the engagement space. Um, some obviously more public and popular than others. Um, you all successfully managed uh, to get three independent directors uh, elected onto the Exxon board that are really thinking about the way that the company thinks about the energy transition and yeah. what does the world look like post fossil fuels. And then by the same token, I think we misunderstand how complex active engagement is. Mm. Um, and so there was you know, a few ESG proposals this year that didn't actually meet the mark of what you wanted. And I would love, partially from my own education, quite frankly, but I would love <laughs> to just have you touch on why is it so hard? Why, why is it so complex and, and maybe not as obvious as we think it is? I think the first place to start is we're talking about ESG aggregated which is within itself very difficult. Yeah. If you break out the E, the S, and the G, right, it is, um, they're all really nuanced, yeah. and it's all really important. And I think we always start with the G. Governance, if you don't have a good governance strategy, then you probably won't have a good environmental strategy, nor will you be actually uh, investing in your workforce or providing health and safety and, and understanding the values of, of the communities that you operate in. So it all starts with the, with the G. Um, Exxon was really interesting because for us, we were able to bring a number of investors to the table um, at our camp on our campaign, um, which really made some key, some key arguments that were rooted in economics. Um, while the energy transition is uh, incredibly important as an underlying story, for us it was, will Exxon exist 10, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. or not, right. based upon the governance structure that they have right now, right? Energy transition is real, and, um, and very publicly they uh, weren't mindful of that in their long-term strategy. Um, and so we were successful in getting someone who um, has run a successful energy company and someone who has successfully transitioned an energy company, someone who has the wherewithal to understand new technologies that may be helpful through the transition. Again, it's really about extending the terminal value. And while we absolutely need fossil fuels in this day and age right now, 20 years out, will we? And if they don't shift the strategy, will they still exist? Um, so, so that's why we were successful there. And there's a lot of nuance to how we think about decarbonization and energy transition. And I'll use uh, General Motors as an example. We've been engaged with them over the last year and a half. Um, 
And we are trying to engage companies about the future that exists now, right? We, we often talk about what's gonna happen 20 years out, but, but right now, companies are implementing strategies that they need to do in order, in order for them to build cars that are gonna be on the road in 10 years. Um, I, this is a complete aside, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, I was driving in, um, in Brooklyn recently, and uh, that, I'm from Brooklyn, and um, I was sort of backing up in parallel parking, and I thought to myself, like, I don't even need to look back anymore. Like there are all these cameras that are embedded in this car and like, yeah. I just, I don't have to. And my four and a half year old will never, well, very unlikely, that they'll look back when they're parallel parking. Right. Um, and I was like, the, f the future is here right now, right? And so when we think about decarbonization, when we think about the strategies that companies are actually putting forth, for us, engagement is about understanding, are you investing in the battery plants that you need to right now? Are you investing in workforce? Uh, a workforce that will be resilient and that will be um, paid well, paid a living wage. Uh, those are the types of things that we're engaging companies on, and we are hoping and trying to ensure that over the course of the long term, um, we understand not only the strategies that these companies are taking, but also the nuance to how they're going to implement said strategy. Yeah. So if so, if you were to come across, you know, a company that sort of had a really wonderful plan on one of the three dimensions, E, S, and G but the other two dimensions were particularly poor. Is that, would you say that that is actually a, a prime opportunity for active engagement? Or, or are you looking for sort of a baseline across all three? It's a little bit of an unfair question because it lacks context. Totally but. unfair. <laughs> um, <laughs> every company is absolutely different. Yeah. Right? Um, I think if you look at a company like Tesla, they are doing really great as it relates to um, battery electric vehicles. Uh, but if you look at um, some other elements, on the social side, they're not doing yeah. so well, um, especially as it relates to diversity and inclusion. Um, if you look at a company like GM or Ford, we need them because consumer behavior and preferences have shifted. And so we all know that we're gonna use, we're gonna be driving electrical, electric vehicles in the future. If incumbents like GM and Ford aren't at the table, then unfortunately, yeah. we're not gonna be able to decarbonize at, in the rate that we, we know that we should. Yeah, no, I love that. We need to see change, not not little little movements. I appreciate that. Um, Under, I want to come to you because I am a, a huge, I'll just say it publicly, I'm a huge fan of Impact Engine um, <laughs> because I think it's really hard in the space to wear a lot of hats and to do it well. Um, you all have a unique perspective where you, in addition to working very directly with your investees, you get to be an LP. And I think as an LP, trying to look for ESG is a very <laughs> different process. Can you share a little bit, both good and bad, about what that looks like on the other on the other side of things? Yeah, for for me, um, right. So we talked a little about on the way in coming to sort of a fund. You want to make sure that it's documented. You want to make sure there's an investment process in place. And then more importantly, uh, when I'm sort of reviewing the diligence that a fund made in an investment, and I see the 100-day plan, if I notice that there was an issue in the third-party ESG report, I want to see that directly in the 100-day plan. And but that sort of all almost when I'm concentrating on the financial ability of this fund. Really my value add or sort of my biggest time when I'm sort of diligating a fund is sort of really looking at the impact. And it's almost an impact question and diligence versus an ESG one. Um, and that sort of starts with everything from the portfolio of the companies, right? That's, I would sort of say in today's age with so much greenwashing going on where there's amazing impact reports with numbers of millions of lives touched, beautiful pictures, et cetera. I really don't, I like care about the narrative, but what I want to sort of see and ultimately is the biggest test is what are you investing on and what is your impact thesis and I'll come there. And then similarly, right, but this is a panel about ESG. So for us, for example, there's a fund um, that is investing sort of using um, an ad an advantageous sort of policy insight in order to invest in critical services in this country, everything from education, financial services, uh, and healthcare. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they're really amazing at is diversity and inclusion when it comes to ESG. Um, they've gone all the way to tie executive competition to sort of rectify the shortcomings identified during diligence, all the way to uh, gathering business leaders in the community to sort of write to the major and say, hey, your response to uh, all this racial equity activity over the summer 
is just not appropriate, and if you don't change things, will sort of move uh, appropriately. So it's sort of really both, I guess, to sort of directly answer the question, it's you want to see that there's a process in place, right. you want to make sure they're following that process, and then you ultimately want to see it in the authenticity of the managers in the portfolio that's being reflected. Right, so for the, for the funds in the room, what I hear you saying, but tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, is that progress counts. Progress counts yeah. a lot. Yeah. And I would actually even argue that, for instance, we invested in another fund that invested in the largest industrial park in Great Britain. It was the single largest property in the UK that per square feet emitted carbon into the air. Yep. And we were like, obviously, the first conversation was like, why the hell did you invest in this? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. um, and then we talked to them, right? And there's a really powerful story that they're taking the most pollutive asset, which has essentially all the know-how of being a traditional oil and gas services company, and that having the know-how and infrastructure to take on the green hydrogen revolution that's coming. Yep. And through essentially buying out the company, transitioning the future pipeline of contracts from oil and gas to sort of the new government uh, supported infrastructure for green hydrogen, yep. that is such a compelling story. And if you talk about the scale of magnitude, right, because they're an impact fund, fully article nine compliant, et cetera, and you see just the amount of carbon attainment that they're doing from that transaction, even though it's not immediately apparent when you sort of go into the website, that sort of active engagement and that sort of progress, I would argue, is sometimes even more uh, impactful. Than, I love that. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, we're going to do one more question and then switch to Q&A. So if you've been holding on to one, now is the time to get in the app um, and send something to this lovely iPad, which I will read. So uh, please send us your questions. Um, Jessica, I want to talk a little bit about trying to meet clients where they are. JP Morgan is huge, um, and despite the largeness, you have built a truly firm-wide approach to sustainability, which is incredibly impressive and I imagine incredibly challenging because not every client is coming to you because of your sustainability prowess. Um, how, how does that conversation go, particularly for the clients that aren't very keen or interested in the space? How do you meet them sort of where they are? Yeah, um, and I'll mostly answer with regard to the private bank where I sit, and I can actually have an influence. Uh, I don't, I don't as much at the firm level, though I partake in a lot of these conversations. But you know, it, it's no surprise to anybody in the room. Nobody, everybody's seen the headlines even lately when he was in Washington. What Jamie says about um, you know energy and the energy transition, um, you know, feels very strongly. You just said it. You know, we are going to be sort of, and one of our colleagues wrote on this. You know, stuck with fossil fuels for longer than we would like is kind of what the tagline was. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, especially now, what we've seen this year is that that's unfortunately really true. And it, there's actually, actually, you know, geopolitical issues and um, viability issues and security issues around needing energy. Um, but at the same time, of course, we are so committed to that energy transition, which, again, when people write about energy at the firm, they also talk about the energy transition and, and you know, that it's irreversible and that it's here. And of course, that there's a lot of investments to be made. So, so at a firm level, very committed and working with clients to pursuing, um, you know, we have, we have goals, large goals around both um, sustainable development goals broadly. We have a DFI at the firm now, which is pretty badass. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, sp more specifically on, on green initiatives, we set up a center for carbon transition. That's actually really important. It kind of like goes to what you do. Like you're, you're in a different way, you're in there influencing Exxon. We in a totally different way have that ability too because we work with them in our investment bank. And so, and so there's lots more examples of that and like where we can really have influence and literally this center for carbon transition is helping clients. Um, right now, it started off with oil and gas sector, power sector, um, energy sector, um, auto sector. Excuse me. And so, you know, trying to move um, to move clients and help them. So anyway, so that's firm wide. Let me bring it to what I actually get to influence on the private bank. Um, and so, it kind of comes back to what I was saying about the four different approaches because. It's about listening to clients. We are not going to clients to suggest in any way what their values should be. So that kind of category of values-based investing is always going to be us in receipt of what clients want to do and helping them do that. So really thorny stuff you can imagine. You, you don't go to clients and tell them what you think that they should do. That is just up to them to decide, and we can help customize portfolios for client preferences. But we are getting much more comfortable now 
talking to clients about this notion of ESG and why it matters to portfolios. So as an example, you know, I keep mentioning these ESG funds. We've done diligence on them for years. We have a really great, robust platform of funds that we can offer to clients that we call sustainable. At the same time, I hired somebody earlier in the year who came to us and he's the head of ESG integration. And he goes around to all of our portfolio managers, the CIO, and, and really teaches them about you know, ESG. And, and that work was underway. We thought it was important. Then the regulators decided to tell us that we had to do it anyway. So it's really good that we had him in place because that's really needed. Um, but but so, so I think we get just so much more comfortable now being on our front foot saying, you know, this is important climate risk is financial risk, like things like that we're much more comfortable saying. And then maybe the last thing I'd add to your question is, where do we get really comfortable leaning in is on some of these thematic ideas. We, um, a fun thing that happened for me in 2019, I've been at JP since 18, was that I found out that our like capital markets group, our investment strategy group, the people who kind of like articulate what we're gonna tell clients, decided to articulate three mega trends. Um, digital transformation, healthcare innovation, and the third was sustainability, and I wasn't in the room. And so that was just something that people who look after like serious megatrends that are gonna go on in the financial services industry and what we should be telling clients decided that we should be telling them that this is a place to invest. So that's like a pretty big statement, yeah. and I, I loved that. And I love, and it's so true, that I was not in the room when that happened. That was just done independent of me trying to be a cheerleader around these issues. <laughs> so, um, so that is something we're, we're really presenting to clients. So like a tangible example of that is like we will, we will have like a, you know, a sort of like, here's where we think you should invest today. I mean, obviously these things, these kind of recommendations change with market, um, market circumstances. And, and now we have this kind of mega trend articulated and there are some investments that we're just putting forward as good investments. Oh, by the way, if you're sustainable and you care about climate, you might wanna do this. Of course, a banker would bring that idea if the client said, I'm interested in climate. But you don't have to say that to your banker. Your banker can just bring you these ideas because we put them forefront as good investment ideas. Right. And that's a really exciting development and, and something that, that we're doing more. So it's, it's more on the front foot on some of these issues than just waiting. Which I love that. To be. No, I love that, right? Because it's, it's, it is an appropriate, and I mean that truly, push-pull. It's, it's, yeah. You need to both be, remind people what they're missing because they don't know what to ask, and then also still have to do a job where you sort of meet their needs where they are. So I love that. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, I'll switch to questions because, as is probably unsurprising to all of you, there's 100. Um, and we have exactly 13 minutes left, so we'll probably not get to all 100. Um, but uh, thank God for socials. So please, please feel free to connect with any of the folks uh, on the stage. Um, uh, I can promise you that they are very busy. So if they don't get back to you immediately, it's not because they don't love you. Um, so I want to start with the most upvoted. This is kind of cool, actually. This is yeah, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funky. Um, I want to start with the most upvoted question because it's a great one. Uh, there's a really, there's a really great question in here about. So something like uh, exclusionary screens, negative or positive, that's something that um, almost every investor could apply to whatever portfolio size, amount, geography that they sit on, right? The idea of taking out or adding in things, whether you're investing in the public equities or in the private markets that meet your values. Uh, not every investor is well set up to do active engagement, mm. uh, either by um, skills and prowess, or, or more importantly, to me anyway, by size. If you're not a huge owner of these companies, but probably not going to listen to you. I would, and this is for all three of you, but, but you, founder, please uh, make sure you jump in. Uh, what do you think about encouraging investors to actually do the active engagement side of things? Are you pro, con, asterisk? There's probably a third option there. I just can't, <laughs> I can't think of it. Thoughts? Do you want to kick it off or? You want to jump for it or should I? Go first. Cool. Um, well, if you're a shareholder of a company, you should be active. That's our standpoint, yep. right? Um, active ownership is, is really important. You know, part of the reason why I talk so much about, or we talk so much at a firm about um, the energy sector, the transportation sector, and food and ag is because if you think about it, that's 75% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we want to go where the problems are because if we don't, if we don't engage with those companies, nothing will change. And so we believe that it is really important to, to use any tool that you have. It could be voting your shares. Um, it could be, you know, showing up at, at an at a annual general meeting, although a lot of them are virtual these days. Um, but, but whatever tool you have to, to be an active owner, we think is really, really important. Um, and so. Yeah, that's that. Yeah. No excuses. I mean, what I would just add is, 
look, Impact Engine, right, we, we have a brand name, et cetera, but we're nine people, a couple of hundred million dollars in AUM. We're not that big, and yet we're sort of active in making a difference. Uh, so yeah, I completely agree with you that if you have a chance to sort of be active, definitely go for it. And at the same time, if you find yourself in a position of greater influence and you just sort of seem to have the know-how or things, be honest, right? Because this is a panel about greenwashing, right? Mm. You don't want to sort of be doing that and sort of be, so there's many resources, but as long as it's sort of on the table, that's progress on our end. Um, it may seem with all the attention we're getting, but realistically, we're still so far from where we need to be. Um, so yeah, I'll take any progress I'm making. Yeah. Uh, I heard a, I heard a little bit of that question talking about like getting it to everyone, yeah. and I think that's so important. And while um, you know technically my title reads that I'm in the private bank, what's really cool is that I actually sit in like the investment solutions part of our business, and those solutions are created for our Chase branch as well. So people who walk into a branch can get investment recommendations that like we we created in our platform, which is really exciting. This is one of the reasons I took this job. It's like imagine the impact you can have from like the biggest families in the world, but to everyone. So on the topic of you know proxy voting and being active, um, you know sort of stay tuned. I don't I don't have like an update on it for now. But when you acquire a fintech company, they come with a lot of cool ideas, and one of them is really about democratizing access to being able to have everybody vote. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, in our due diligence process, we'd like to see companies that vote, but we don't today just have the ability to just do that. Um, we're, we're, we favor it, but, um, you know, we're trying to get that access, and I think that we'll, we'll have more to say on that in the future, which will be exciting. That's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And something that I heard all three of you sort of say is that uh, par part of doing this work well is not, is asking the questions. What, what neither, what none of you said is you have to have the answers. You all said you have to ask the questions. And so I think one of, one of the downsides um, of, of the space that we all operate in is that we have a, a really robust, let's use the word robust, uh, set of terms and mm. definitions, lots of jargon. It's kind of exclusive, quite frankly. It's hard to break in. Um, and so this, to me, is an example of sort of our, our language getting the better of us because we sort of communicate to people that you need to be able to talk all of this to ask really good questions. That's not at all true, that you need to be able to ask questions. Um, and a, a, a shareholder that owns one share or owns a million shares probably probably can and should ask those questions equally. So, so thank you all for sharing that. Um, I want to, this is not actually a, a focus of, of what we talked about today, but it's a great question. So, um, Andre, you were asking me if there were any, if I was going to throw any like rando left, left, <laughs> left, left side, blind side, what am I saying? Curveball. Curve curve thank ball. you. Curveball. <laughs> Clearly not a baseball <laughs> fan. Clearly. Clearly, my hockey is showing. Uh, Curveballs, um, and, and this is an interesting one. Um, what do you all think about critical policy, legislative, regulatory motions and movements that we need to really bring this work to scale? And maybe just for, for time and sanity, let's restrict it to the United States, just for the purpose of our conversation. What do you, you what want to do talk you? about European regulation? <laughs> that's right. They're sitting at their version Fine. of SOCAP. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, they're like, right now. That's right. That's right. Now is the time. Now is the exact <laughs> moment. Um, what do you think? What, what would you like to see to, to, make, uh, to make your jobs easier, but then just the, this whole field just sort of accelerate the way that we need? And that's for anyone. I'm happy to kick off. Um, I mean, look, this is such a whole conversation, we could have a panel, and we sort of only have seven minutes left. Right. So I'll sort of throw my, my grain of sand. For me, the, there's a sort of, what I would sort of love to focus this question on. There's a nuance that we got to be aware of when sort of regulation gets involved, right? It is really good for regulators to get involved because it's going to codify a lot of the processes and all this sort of uncertainty of where we are, where there's no standard, there's no one way of sort of doing things which sort of makes greenwashing possible, right? Because it's sort of up to everyone to define. Now, whatever that standard you set, there is also the danger that if you make it too stringent or too difficult, as we mentioned this, well, maybe I don't want to be an ESG focus fund. And all this progress that we're doing of having the ability to ask the questions, and at least even if you don't have an answer or if you're not sort of dictating that to be your strategy, there is a real danger of sort of drawing a line in the sand of like, hey, here's the 10% of people who care about ESG, and they are the ESG funds, and all 90% of you who don't meet this high bar, you can go back to doing the business that you were doing. That is the thing that scares me. Mm. And obviously, there, it's a tight balance, and mm -hmm. I don't have an answer for it, yeah. but I want that to be part of the conversation. So important. I, I mean, I, I just think, you know, what's 
what's good is standardization. Yeah. What I see is one of the things that we'll see how it irons out is like asking for too much precision. Um, or being, yeah, just like being too prescriptive in, 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 in the regulation. So we'll see, we'll see how that, some of that pans out. Um, and I'm not sure this is really what the question was getting at, but just because on my panel that I did yesterday, I had Fran Siegel from the Impact Investing Alliance. And you need people like her, you need people going to Washington and advocating on all of our behalf. It's not something I necessarily do in my seat, but I, I love people like her that are field builders, that are like making sure that, you know, the voices of what we're trying to do are, are, are reflected in some yeah. of these policies. Yeah. The only thing I'd add is Please. we've already seen in this year the government spending quite a bit of capital um, to accelerate in advance some of the things that we're all trying to work towards, yep. right? Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act or the, the CHIPS Act, like all these things are actually helpful to companies, large public equities, and uh, and hopefully downstream to end customers um, to be able to provide incentives to actually do this work. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it can be really tricky <laughs> mm -hmm. if it is too prescriptive. Other times... Um, there's ways to advance and invest uh, from the government. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a question in here that uh, that I will take because I opened this Pandora's box, which mm. is why no one should ever give me a mic. Um, but there's a really important question here about whether ESG as process as opposed to outcomes is inherently greenwashing. And whoever sent that and the six people that upvoted it, thank you, because it's a really important question. In the work that we do, um, I, I think Part of the problem that we're trying to solve is the uniform taxonomy of ESG for an approach that is not at all uniform. Yusuf was sort of touching on this. Uh, I haven't ever worked with a client that nails the E, S, and G immediately, or, or actually nails any single one of, of those pieces. Really, uh, quite frankly, we, we probably need three different terms that all mean the same thing because they require a completely different level of investment, a com completely different level of time tolerance and patience different actors at the table, different partnership, different scale of investment. And so building ESG in process, uh, to, at least in the work that we do, essentially means, are you asking all of the relevant questions when you are making an investment decision? If you are investing in a very uh, heavily footprinted, natural environment type company, yes, you should be looking because of materiality at the environmental exposure, but that doesn't mean that you ignore the composition of the board or the management team mm. or the C-suite or the pay differential between the least paid person at the company and the most paid person at the company. All these things matter. And so when you have ESG as outcome alone, we've sort of facilitated an ignorance of the other factors that aren't relevant. ESG as process gives us an opportunity to ask those questions in the due diligence process to know if a particular product or fund is, is thinking a little bit about that. And so to me, actually, uh, it, it's not always an or. If done well, it's an and. Um, but ESG as process is a little bit of a baseline that we use just to make sure that we're scran scanning and screening, excuse me, uh, for all the right things. I'm, I'm you open. know where it yeah. comes in, though? And yeah. by the way, touting your piece that you did for Impact Alpha a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, which is excellent, unpacking some of this. But I think where this is like, and I've been talking about this a lot on stage, you've been talking about this, you know, people are confused yeah. because ESG, and you know, we all saw the magazine, well-known magazine a couple months ago, I forget when, earlier this year, yeah. that said, you know, three acronyms that, you know, three letters that aren't going to save the planet. And I'm like, but when did we say ESG was going to save that? If you are right. saying that it's going to do something that it's not set up to do, okay, you're yep. getting into a little bit of greenwashing. But if you say that yep. it's, you know, smart investing, that you should be thinking about these factors, you know, that engagement is an overlay where I could kind of have an impact. These are the right things to say, yeah. but not promise. If you have, when we hear clients say that they really want to influence climate or do something along climate, we recommend a climate fund. Yep. Not necessarily just trying to tell them that they're going to get those outcomes through an ESG fund. And I think that's what's really important on that. Yeah. Yeah. And Andre, you were saying this at the beginning, and I think everyone on stage here would agree that, that in the work that we do, if you're not thinking about ESG, you're just not analyzing risk. I mean, really, if we wanted to bring it down to the simplest, easiest framework, if you, if you have a risk function in your firm or fund uh, and, and people or planet don't matter to you, probably there's going to be a surprise in anywhere between 18 months to eight years. So, uh, so sorry about that. So we feel <laughs> for you. But there is, there is sort of this component of just better, higher uh, holistic risk management, which, which uh, I wish... I wish we could do a better job, I think, as an ecosystem of, of sort of talking about it that way. Um, I want to wrap with one lightning round question. Um, and that is, uh, I know it's a little cliche, but I actually, it's my favorite part of these conversations. I want to talk a little bit about, as each of you look out 10 years, 
uh, where do you want to see the ESG movement? Under let's start with you. Yeah, so 10 years is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> For me, let me sort of break into short, medium, and long. Please. Short, I would love to see, uh, if you sort of read the, the latest uh, sustainable investment investor survey that PWC did, one of the facts they highlight is there is a big gap in things that are concern and things you've undertaken action. And ESG is a thing of a lot of concern, but few firms are yet to take action. I would love that cap to sort of converge and say like, it's a concern and we're taking action. Medium term is I don't want this panel to be about ESG, I want this panel to be about impact washing. Yeah. Long term, this is right, so happy to be back in SOCAP and have the, the ability to, to meet with people and a lot of the things that have changed, right? We changed venues, we're sort of now back in person. But one of the things that you notice is almost that there's very few clean tech sustainability funds here. Uh, as someone who's sort of in this conference to meet with prospective funds, mm -hmm. I was shocked as to someone who receives so many emails about green funds mm -hmm. that there's almost none here. Wow. Um, I want, and it's because they have their own conferences. It's because they're now mainstream. It's because they're a sustainable megatrend. Yeah. I want that to sort of have an avenue for us and have a broader discussion. Love that. Thank you. Um, I, just for a little bit of context about my crystal ball, because I couldn't really imagine we'd be where we are today. Um, I, I, uh, in 2007, my old boss from Cambridge Associates, where I had started my career, called me up and basically said, we've got this job opportunity. Do you want to come and do mission, back to the firm and do mission-related investing, which didn't roll off the tongue in 2007 for really a lot of people, except some of the leading foundations doing it. And I said, sure. And I, but I was really trying to understand what that would look like. And basically what he told me was the firm was making a three-year commitment to it, and we'd just see. Because literally in 2007, 2008, when I finally rejoined, it was like not clear where this was going to go. Can you imagine that? I mean, this has become such a mainstream topic now. These jobs are everywhere. The job market for things like what we do is so hot. So anyway, it's just a funny thing I laugh about because like the crystal ball, like going backwards, did not necessarily figure we'd be at this point. Going forward, I echo some of what was said here. You know, I hope, I hope I don't necessarily have to have a conversation about how this is just strong fiduciary duty on the ESG front in 10 years. You know, um, I kind of hope the controversy we even find this in in the U.S. has just kind of gone away and we are more accepting of this. Um, but also, you know, that, so that kind of almost puts like ESG where it's not even discussed as much anymore because it's accepted. But I think the impact stuff, when I say 10 years from now, I think we still need to focus on it. And I really hope the flows are going because that's where we really need to drive impact. And so, you know, being at the Global Impact Investing Network conference last week, like, I think those numbers that they're announcing are great, but they need to, they need to move forward faster. So that's my hope. Thank you. I hope we're not asking the same question yeah. 10 years from now. Yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, as investors, we are impatient. We are impatient for uh, our end clients. We are impatient for the stakeholder groups that these companies impact. Um, it is important that companies are setting the strategies now that will impact the next 10 years. And so the conversation about ESG 10 years out is really not a conversation that we need to be having 10 years out. It's about what we're doing right now um, to ensure that the outcomes that we're all looking for is what the conversation is then. Yeah, I love that. Thank you all for your time and expertise so much. Thank you all for being here and hanging with us on Thursday. Uh, hopefully more to come. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thanks again to Rahana, Amber, Jessica, Nisa for this thoughtful conversation and for setting us on a course toward the good and away from the evil. Thanks again. And as a reminder to all of you, we'll be back here at noon for the closing plenary focused on activation, how to put ideas into practice, and then we'll see you soon.